Season 3, Episode 1. Mabel. Oh boy, it's the season opener, and you know what that means. Gene time! We get a montage of Gene going about his usual tasks at Cinnabon. He munches down on a pathetic excuse for a sandwich during his lunch break, as this dumbass kid drops some stolen goodies right in front of him. The police ask Gene if he's seen any dumbass kids around here, and Gene rats him out. However, Gene remembers that snitches get stitches, so he screams at the kid to get a lawyer. Gene goes back to work, and then he has a heart attack and dies. We're taken back to the moment Jimmy confessed to Chuck that he swapped the numbers. Chuck puts the tape recorder in his desk as Jimmy calls Howard, telling him that Chuck is no longer mega cuckoo. Jimmy helps Chuck take down the space blanket shit off his walls, and Chuck shows Jimmy how to gently roll the tape off the wall, instead of ripping it off like a crackhead. Also, holy shit, look at Chuck's right thumb. That thing is longer than my lifespan. No wonder Rebecca married him. Chuck and Jimmy have a small bonding moment as Jimmy discovers an old book that Chuck used to read to him as a kid. But Chuck ruins it by being a piece of shit. She was Jimmy. Always... Don't think I'll ever forget what happened here today. And you will pay. The scenes with Chuck and Jimmy actually getting along are some of the most painful, because they serve as short glimpses of what could have been. Jimmy busts into Kim's office and talks to her about his conversation with Chuck, and how, for a brief moment, he didn't feel like Chuck hated his guts. Meanwhile, Chuck is busy hating Jimmy's guts, presenting a pissed-off-looking Howard the tape of Jimmy confessing to his crimes. However, Howard says that the tape is pretty much useless, pointing out the multiple legal boundaries, preventing it from being admitted as evidence. Chuck, if that tape is useless in a court of law and no help in the court of public opinion, what's the point? Because I can't think of a single use for it. I can. We're taken back to the moment Mike found the don't note on his car, and Mike hurries the fuck out of there. He stops his car for a brief moment, figuring that someone must have put a tracker on it somewhere, so he stops it by a junkyard to search around and pick it apart. In any other boring TV show, this scene would last something like 30 seconds, maybe a minute, minute and a half. However, Better Call Saul is the best show on TV, so it says, Fuck that, we're gonna spend like 4 minutes straight on this shit, and it's gonna be peak TV. Mike eventually gives up, asking the junkyard owner to call a cab. However, he notices a fuel cap in the shop, which gives him an epiphany. He checks the fuel cap he dismissed early on in the montage, and bingo, he finds the tracker. He writes down the model of the tracker on a notepad, and Jimmy deals with some old lady at his office. He meets that one dude from Fifi, who's really pissed off that Jimmy lied to him in order to gain access to the B-29. He tells Jimmy to pull the ad off the air, and Jimmy starts arguing back, and for a brief moment, lets his frustrations toward Chuck seep into the argument. He wasn't even in a wheelchair. Well, yeah, well, periodically he is, and when he shows up in court, you better believe he'll be in a wheelchair. Right, because you're an ambulance chasing piece of shit, because you're all the same, you're the same as all Always on a high horse, always trying to make me feel like I'm... Mike heads home after a hard day of doing nothing, and he meets with Dr. Caldera, asking him to buy the tracker model he wrote down earlier. Paige compliments Kim on her epic lawyering abilities, and bitches to Kim about Chuck getting the address wrong during Nailed. Kim writes some stuff down on her computer, and... Wait, is that Cambria font? Oh my god, I use Cambria font too. Maybe she really is writing my script. Anyways, Kim has some trouble picking the right punctuation. And later, Ernesto delivers some supplies for Chuck, including a fresh package of batteries for the tape recorder. Chuck is a little baby bitch and has trouble putting the batteries in, so Ernesto helps him, and accidentally plays the recording of Jimmy getting exposed. It changed 1261 to 1216. It was me. Turn that off! Turn it off! It all went... Turn it off! You need to understand something. You must not. You cannot! Tell anyone there could be terrible consequences. Mike receives the tracker from Dr. Caldera and replaces the original tracker in the fuel cap with his brand new one. He chomps down some pistachios as he watches over his car, and he spots an unidentified figure who takes the fuel cap from his car with a brand new tracker inside, which Mike uses as an Uno reverse car to track the location of his trackers. He heads off in his car, ready to kick gum and chew ass. Not a bad season opener. This one's getting an A tier to kick off season 3. Season 3, Episode 2, Witness. Stupid piece of shit Chuck locks every door in his house. He knows that Jimmy is probably going to find out about the tape at some point, and figures that he's going to try to break in and steal it. So he's preparing like a bomb's going to go off, going as far as to hire a round-the-clock private investigator. Meanwhile, Mike continues to track down the dude to put the tracker in his car, who picks up a trillion dead drops on his way. Eventually, the dude leads Mike to some random restaurant. Hey, wait a second. This isn't some random restaurant. 
Obviously, every Breaking Bad fan creamed their pants when they saw this, but you gotta figure that Better Call Saul only viewers were probably like, what, it's just a restaurant, why is it so dramatic? Oh my god, it's Wendy's. Anyways, Kim and Jimmy start looking for employees to work in their office, and their first applicant, Francesca Liddy, another Breaking Bad alumni, walks through the doors. Francesca makes a really good first impression on Jimmy during the interview process, so Jimmy makes a rational decision and hires her immediately. Kim asks Jimmy what the fuck he's doing, but Jimmy persuades Kim to give Francesca a test run, since he's got a commercial that's gonna air in 10 minutes. The test run ends up going well, with Francesca mentioning Cracker Barrel every two seconds, but she ends up getting a call from Mike, who's less interested in Cracker Barrel and more in a certain other restaurant. Ermin Trout? I, I hear Cracker Barrel has excellent air... This one really don't want to talk about Cracker Barrel. He requests Jimmy for his services once again, asking him to spy on a dude carrying a knapsack in a Los Pollos Hermanos. As Jimmy spots the guy, he tries to subtly listen in on his conversation, but fails miserably, dumping like 40 sugars into his coffee, and then proceeding to spray Powerade over himself. <laughs> That's what the kids call epic fail. He moves closer to the guy as he takes a sip of his now shitty coffee, and the dude walks out of the restaurant, his knapsack still in hand, thinking that he put something from the bag in the garbage. Jimmy proves that he learned absolutely nothing from Rico and starts dumpster diving once again. He gets his fat ass stuck in the can and doesn't find anything, and some random dude asks Jimmy if he needs anything. Can I help you? Uh. Hooray! We're finally reintroduced to Gus, who helps Jimmy get his watch out of the garbage. Mike gets pissed at Jimmy for not finding anything, and he continues to spy in the restaurant. He spots a black car parked in the back, which is driven by Victor, and Mike starts to tail him. Meanwhile, Ernesto pulls up in his fucking Dynaco Blue lift, and he tells her about Chuck's secret tape recording. Kim tells Jimmy about the tape, but before she does, she asks him for a dollar in order to obtain client confidentiality, something that Jimmy pulled on Walt and Jesse back in Breaking Bad. First things first, you're gonna put a dollar in my pocket, both of you. You want attorney-client privilege, don't you? So that everything you say is strictly between us. Hello, I can't- Give me a dollar. I'll give you a dollar. Yeah, just hand me a dollar, okay. come on. All I got's a 20. Fine, whatever. All right, I'm your lawyer now. Jimmy tries to tell Kim that he confessed to Chuck because of how mentally unwell he was, but Kim tells Jimmy about the tape that Chuck had hidden, which makes Jimmy incredibly sad. It's interesting to see how Chuck and Jimmy initially react to each other's betrayals, while Chuck acts like a belligerent asshole and immediately tries to get back at Jimmy. Jimmy is just... crushed. Hey, thanks, Francesca. You were great today. You too. Those folks love you. Who doesn't? Like, since he legitimately loves his brother, he actually takes time to process his betrayal, and doesn't immediately resort to anger. At least, not yet. Kim tells Jimmy that Chuck legally can't use the tape against him, and that they should wait for Chuck to make the first move. However, as Jimmy removes the tape off the wall, he realizes that he's using the same technique Chuck had taught him just last episode, which causes his betrayal to really settle in. As he rips the tape off the wall and runs out the door, Mike locates the tracker right in the middle of the road, with a cell phone placed right on top. Meanwhile, Howard shows off his insane parkour skills, and leads himself all the way to Chuck's house without even a speck of dirt on his suit. A true gentleman. Howard tells Chuck that his secret plan to catch Jimmy is starting to get expensive, considering the P.I. working around the clock, and tells him that Jimmy's definitely not going to break in at night. And he's absolutely right. Jimmy's not going to break in at night. You are such an asshole. I'm not sure if it's just me, but like he was already really good, but I don't know, something about his acting this season is really impressive. This episode's getting an A tier. Season 3, Episode 3. Sunk Costs. The episode begins with a pair of fake Jordans falling from the heavens, as a Los Pollos Hermanos truck drives off in the distance. After this, we're taken back to the moment Mike found the cell phone on the tracker, and he answers a call from Gus, who tells him to wait for his DoorDash delivery. Mike's delivery comes with a chicken quesadilla, a Baja Blast, and a side order of Gus, who tells Mike why he put the don't note on his car. You care to elaborate? It's not in my interest for Hector Salamanca to die at this time. 
Gus essentially tells Mike, Hey, only I'm angry at Hector, so only I get to kill him. Me, me, me. And Mike agrees not to kill Hector, as long as Gus stops tracking his every move. Gus's hate boner for Hector grows ever stronger, as Mike suggests a way to get police attention on Hector, as well as disrupt his supply line. Jimmy calls Francesca to tell her he fucked up, as he has a smoke by the curb, ready to be taken away by the cops. Asshole Chuck tries to tell Jimmy that he's doing this for his own good, believing that some quality jail time will set Jimmy straight and make him a better person, instead of being, you know, a caring and supportive brother. Fucking dick. Here's what's gonna happen. One day you're gonna get sick. One of your employees is gonna find you curled up in that space blanket, take you to the hospital, hook you up to those machines that beep and whir and hurt. And this time, it'll be too much. And you will die there. Alone. Oh my god. I mean, like, I hate Chuck too, but like, like, I'm hurt, and that, that wasn't even for me. Jimmy gets picked up by the cops in a quality-ass montage, where he's taken to the police station and booked. Bill Oakley tries to make fun of him, but is immediately shot down. Don't you want to throw the book at me for old time's sake? Mm, I'll see if I can work some magic. But those decisions are really above my pay grade. Oh yeah? When did they start paying you? In a stunning move by the show, we get another montage right afterwards, displaying Kim's morning routine with like 20 close-up shots of her feet. We've gotten two montages in one episode before in the Breaking Bad universe, but to my knowledge, this is the very first episode to feature two back-to-back -back montages. An excellent play by the show, definitely going to pay off for the rest of the show going forward. Ernesto meets Kim in the parking lot and tells her that he got his ass fired and Jimmy's ass in jail. Kim rushes over to the court to represent Jimmy in his case, but Jimmy says nah, -uh, and he pleads not guilty and posts bail. He takes a cab to the office and tells Kim that he fucked up. I fucked up. See, I wasn't joking this time. Jimmy rants about how he got owned by Chuck, and apologizes to Kim for putting all this pressure on her. Mike receives some cocaine from Mr. Poof Poof from all the way back in Crawl Space. Puff, puff, puff. And Bill Oakley eats one of the most god-awful excuses for a meal I've ever been witness to in my entire life. I know I criticize a lot of the food on this show, but this easily takes the cake for the absolute worst. This Chef Boyardee looking motherfucker is eating two bags of chips with a side of coffee. This man is getting four grains of protein maximum from those two bags of chips combined, so he's pretty much relying entirely on that one cup of coffee to keep him energized. But that's assuming that he even finishes the bag of chips, which he doesn't. He eats like two chips out of the bag, chugs his coffee, and then throws them away. No wonder he steals Jimmy's food. Asshole. Anyways, Bill tells Jimmy that he isn't prosecuting the case, and he asks Jimmy if Davis and Maine let him keep the company car, and Jimmy tells him that they didn't. Good. He probably would've tried to steal that too. Shit dick. Mike ties up a pair of fake Jordans and hides the bag of coke inside, and he tosses them into the air, landing them on a power line. He waits nearby with a sniper rifle, and as one of Hector's trucks pulls by, he snipes the shoes, sprinkling dust from the cocaine ferry all over the truck. As the truck is searched by the police, one of the drug dogs sniffs out the cocaine, getting the two drivers arrested. Meanwhile, Kim and Jimmy have a smoke outside the office, and Jimmy tells Kim the news that he received a PPD, and can avoid jail time as long as he confesses to his charges. However, he'd also have to send a confession to the New Mexico Bar Association, an act that will likely get Jimmy disbarred. Jimmy and Kim know that Chuck intentionally set this all up to prevent Jimmy from working in law again, so they officially decide to team up, and take Chuck down together. So what now? Now? Now we, uh, take that PPD and we shove it right up Chuck's ass. Hi, A-Tier. Season 3, Episode 4, Sabrosito. We're taken to a flashback to the piss-colored land of Mexico, as we're reintroduced to Don Eladio, who's recreating that one Nirvana album cover. Yeah, that one. Hector tells Don Eladio about his brand new ice cream business, and brings in his monthly earnings along with a lame-ass bobblehead doll. Eladio is initially impressed, until Juan Bolsa brings in Gustavo's monthly earnings, as well as a way cooler Los Pollos Hermanos t-shirt. Eladio makes fun of Hector for being jealous of Gus, and everyone goes inside as Hector silently looks into the pool. Poor Hector. What did he do to deserve this? <laughs> Oh yeah, my bad. Back in the present, Hector's ice cream shop gets raided by the cops, and Mike celebrates by watching my videos with Kaylee and Stacy. Hector is really salty about his business getting fucked up, so he retaliates by dicking around in Los Pollos Hermanos, lighting up a fat ciggy and asking to see the assistant manager's balls. Uh, men's room is over there on the left. Cabron, I need to see your boss. K. 
Okay. Well, I'm I'm the assistant manager. The manager's actually not. I need to see you a boss. The boss. Okay. Well, I'm I need I'm to just... see you a boss. Uh, I'm sure I could help you with whatever you need. I need okay. boss. Uh, okay, sir. If you if you don't mind, there are, there are other customers. I need to see you a boss. Gus rushes over to the restaurant and talks with Hector in his office, who demands Gus to ship his product north while scraping shit off his shoe. Hector exits the restaurant, and Gus cleans up the place, hitting a fat three in the process. Mike receives a fat stack from Victor, but he tells Victor to tell Gus that they're square, and throws it back in his car, hitting a fat three in the process. In the span of two minutes, we have two confirmed characters in the Breaking Bad universe that could feasibly outperform Shaq. Gus apologizes to his employees the next morning, making up a story as to why Hector and his men showed up to the restaurant. Many years ago, I opened my first Los Pollos Hermanos in Michoacan. Those same men showed up. They wanted money. I'm ashamed to say that I paid them. But yesterday, yesterday they came here. They intimidated my customers. <laughs> Kim looks around for the place that Chuck called to have his door repaired, and cancels the appointment, having Jimmy send Mike over instead. Chuck tells Mike to not use any tools and involve electricity, but Mike tells him to get dicked and uses them anyways. With Chuck's attention averted, Mike starts taking photos of the house, displaying the abnormal condition it's currently in. Mike gives Jimmy the pictures at the diner, as well as a note containing some other info about Chuck and his home. Later that night, Gus asks Mike why he didn't take his money, and Mike tells him that he did the job for him and himself alone. Gus thanks Mike for fucking with Hector, and makes Mike an intriguing offer. Well, perhaps in the future? You will consider working for me. Would you care to know why I stopped you from killing Hector? A bullet to the head would have been far too humane. Man, this guy is not happy. Jimmy sits in his chair like his dad just caught him playing the Xbox in the middle of the night. As Howard enters the room, turning off all the lights in the process. Also, I just want to say, whoever came up with the idea of Chuck being sensitive to electricity is an actual genius. It not only gives us some interesting visuals and fantastic moments, but it also perfectly represents the complete pettiness of Chuck's character. Like, imagine being so annoyed by someone that you get cancer. Also, I mentioned this before, but the lights being turned off whenever Chuck is around is such a great way of representing Jimmy's day literally being darkened by Chuck's presence. Speaking of Chuck's presence, likely serial killer Chuck McGill walks into the room. Chuck's lawyer finalizes the terms of Jimmy's confession, but she feels as if the confession isn't sorry enough, so she forces Jimmy to give Chuck an apology. Jimmy rightfully gives Chuck an extremely passive-aggressive apology. I regret it all. All of it more than you can imagine. Because you're my brother. And no one should treat his own brother like that. Not ever. After the meeting, Kim confronts Chuck, telling him that she suspects that there's a duplicate of the tape, since Chuck knew that Jimmy was going to break in at some point. Chuck tells Kim that Jimmy actually destroyed the duplicate, and that the original is locked away, ready to be used in court. Well, what? Bingo. Holy shit, this episode is a million times better than I remember it being. This one is jam-packed with some fantastic moments, as well as a ton of great shots as well. The cinematography in this show is already top-notch, but something about this episode is especially great. Like, they didn't need to hook the camera to the ceiling, but they did anyways because they thought it looked cool. And it did! An easy S tier. I'm shocked at how underrated and overshadowed this episode is, but something tells me that's likely because of the episode I'm about to cover next. Season 3, Episode 5, Chicanery. Oh boy, we finally reached one of the most iconic episodes of Better Call Saul. One that single-handedly brought the word chicanery back into the public lexicon. We open with a flashback of Chuck removing all the electrical units out of his house. As he prepares dinner for him, Jimmy, and Rebecca, he lies to Rebecca, telling her that the lights are turned off due to a power outage. Rebecca and Chuck have a nice conversation about Jimmy being a lawyer and old ladies on scooters, until Rebecca's phone starts to go off, causing Chuck's EHS to flare up as she walks closer to him. I love this moment with a score as it starts to intensify the closer Rebecca gets to Chuck, but then settles down as she walks away. Got it, got it. I will make sure that... Um, can, can, can you hold on a second? Let me just get a pen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hold on one second. No, 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 no,
God damn it! Chuck eventually can't take the pain any longer, and he bitch slaps the phone out of Rebecca's hand. Instead of admitting the truth, however, he berates her for answering the phone during dinner, and she storms out of the house. Back in the present, Jimmy goes to Dr. Caldera's office and asks him for an assistant, while the court is accommodated for Chuck's condition. Howard asks Chuck if he really wants to take the stand, since he figures that the case is in the bag anyways. This is not the time to worry about how we look. This is about what's right and what's wrong. I'm not going to risk Jimmy getting, what, a year of suspension? He deserves disbarment, not some slap on the wrist. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. We get a great scene of Jimmy and Kim getting ready for the court battle that lies ahead, as the attorney representing against Jimmy reads out Jimmy's alleged crimes. Afterwards, Kim reads out her case defending Jimmy, and the first witness, Howard, is called to the stand. Howard recalls the story of Jimmy breaking into the house and damaging the cassette tape, and he recalls how surprised he was when Jimmy managed to obtain a law degree while working in the mailroom. Kim asks Howard why the firm didn't hire him, and Howard explains that they feared it would come across as nepotism, to which Kim exposes him for being a hypocrite. Your firm is Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill, right? Who's the other Hamlin? My father. Eventually, he was hired by the firm of Davis and Maine. I'd be happy to say more about that, if you'd like. No. Kim elaborates on the rest of the lies and hypocritical actions of Chuck, explaining how Jimmy had taken care of Chuck for so long, only to be betrayed by him, exposing him for being a big meanie head. Things seem pretty cool for Jimmy, until the court says that they'll be playing the entirety of the tape recording. Before this, Jimmy talks to Francesca, who tells him that a flight's been delayed for a certain person. I'm begging your pardon, um, the defense requests a moment to review, if we could. What are we doing? While Chuck practices for his testimony, we get another great scene of the court playing the tape, with a great zoom in on Kim during the segment of Jimmy saying he pulled the scheme for her. Afterwards, the court prepares for Chuck's arrival, turning off all the lights and taking everyone's electronic devices, with Jimmy claiming that he left his phone in the car. As Chuck and Howard enter the building, Chuck accidentally bumps into a certain individual, who looks back at him, reasonably happy. Chuck is sworn in to testify, and recalls the allegations of Jimmy swapping the Mesa Verde numbers. The attorney asks Chuck to elaborate on his illness, and Chuck admits that he's never been officially diagnosed with EHS. He claims that while the illness affects him physically, he's perfectly lucid, and the attorney asks him, an interesting question. Do you hate your brother? Absolutely not. Yeah, you do. He has a way of doing the worst things for reasons that sound almost noble. But what I know for sure is that the law is too important to be toyed with. And the way my brother treats the law, it breaks my heart. While Kim and Jimmy take a moment to confer, Chuck is absolutely blindsided, as none other than Rebecca walks through the door, and he asks the court for a breather. He talks to Rebecca, who tells him that Jimmy had informed her about his illness, and while she offers him to leave, he tells her to stay, saying that she's been had, and that she'll witness the truth in court. During the break, Jimmy munches on literal dollar store barbecue potato chips when there are real barbecue potato chips sitting right in front of him. I mean, granted, it's not as much of a national tragedy as Bill munching on two bags of chips, but still, massive L for Jimmy. F tier. You know, she's gonna hate you when this is over. Yep. As the court reconvenes, Jimmy begins his cross-examination of Chuck. He asks him to elaborate on where he hid the tape, and what the state of his house looked like at the time of the recording. Chuck reveals that it was tucked under a space blanket, what the fucking do, and that his living room was covered in space blankets as well. Chuck claims that he played up his condition to provoke Jimmy into a confession, and that his house was normal every other day of the week. However, Jimmy proves this to be false, showing the pictures of Chuck's house, including one of an open lantern sitting on top of newspapers. The attorney tries to deny Jimmy delving into Chuck's mental state, but Jimmy claims that this move is important into understanding Chuck's motives. Uh, he claims that he lied to me to get me to tell the truth. And I'm telling you, I lied to my brother to make him feel better. Which of us you believe depends on how we all understand the mind of Charles McGill. Jimmy elaborates on Chuck's illness, explaining that the symptoms first began after his divorce with Rebecca. Chuck apologizes to Rebecca for hiding the illness from her, and tries to expose Jimmy for bringing her in, chalking it up as an attempted ruse by Jimmy to break Chuck down. Jimmy continues, and begins to hone in on Chuck's supposed illness, asking him what electricity feels like to him, 
Chuck explains that the farther away an electrical object is, the less pain that he feels, and vice versa. Jimmy walks closer to Chuck, asking if he can feel any sources of electricity at the moment, and Chuck tries to out Jimmy as a failure. He asks Jimmy if he has something in his pocket, and Jimmy reveals that he had his cell phone hidden on himself, and puts it in front of Chuck. Chuck reveals that he didn't feel anything due to the battery being removed from the phone, and makes fun of Jimmy for being a total loser. At least, for a moment. What do I have to do to prove it to you? Could you reach into your breast pocket and tell me what's there? Can you tell the court what that was? A battery. Jimmy reveals that Huel planted Jimmy's cell phone battery on him nearly two hours ago, and that Chuck felt nothing the entire time. The entire court starts to lose its shit, and the pressure begins to be too much for Chuck to handle. If he were schizophrenic, Schiz it wouldn't take away from the fact that the I defendant- I am not crazy! I am not crazy. I know he swapped those numbers. I knew it was 1216. One after Magna Carta, as if I could ever make such a mistake. Never. Never. I just, I just couldn't prove it. He, he covered his tracks. He got that idiot at the copy shop to lie for him. Mr. McGill, please, you don't have to go You think in. this is something, you think this is bad. This, this chicanery. <laughs> He defecated through a sunroof. He'll never change ever since he was nine. Always the same. Couldn't keep his hands out of the cash drawer. But not our Jimmy. Couldn't be precious Jimmy. Stealing them blind. And he gets to be a lawyer? What a sick joke. I should have stopped him when I had the chance. And you, you have to stop him. You... Chuck apologizes for his outburst, and Jimmy slumps back to his chair, knowing that his con succeeded. Chuck looks up at the exit sign, his symptoms flaring up, and he realizes once and for all that the illness was all in his head. He explained earlier that the further an object is from his person, the less pain that he feels. But with such an insurmountable amount of stress laid on him, the electrical currents of the exit sign that once felt far away, now feel all too close for comfort. <laughs> Damn, there's quite a good reason why this episode is so high up on everybody's lists. Many people consider this to be the first real amazing episode of the series, and that it truly cemented Better Call Saul as its own thing, and not just the Breaking Bad spinoff. Chicanery is the culmination of three and a half seasons worth of build-up, and it all comes crashing down beautifully. The cold open does a great job of reintroducing us to Rebecca, as well as emphasizing the importance of Chuck's mental illness. That moment when Rebecca walks into the courtroom to a stunned Chuck is when the episode really goes from Oh yeah! To... Oh yeah! That entire rant near the end has such a plethora of amazing callbacks that expertly demonstrate how much of a resentful douchebag Chuck really is. Particularly with that couldn't be precious Jimmy line. It really feels like years worth of jealousy and hatred spat out in just a few words. While everyone does an amazing job this episode, Michael McKean really does steal the entire show. I know I've done nothing but shit on Chuck for the past like two videos, but I just want to elaborate that I don't hate Michael McKean. Actually, the fact that I hate Chuck as much as I do is in part to his amazing performance, and this episode in particular is a massive home run for him. Bravo, Vince. The pacing of this episode is tighter than an old lady's c and it's pretty amazing that this episode doesn't once cut to the cartel plot of the show. It's all Chuck versus Jimmy the entire way through, which was definitely for the best. Anyways, I think I've said my piece about this episode, and I don't think you'll be surprised when I say that Chicanery is getting the first double S tier on our list, an excellent mid-season showdown three and a half seasons in the making. Season 3, Episode 6 off-brand. The episode begins with Hector pissing into a cup, as he watches Nacho deal with Crazy 8. Crazy 8 is light on cash, and while Nacho's about to let this one go, Hector criticizes him for being a little pussy bitch, which Nacho disproves by beating the shit out of Crazy 8. No! No, I'm sorry! I'm sorry! No! Nacho gets a big ouchie on his finger while working in his father's shop, and we're taken back to the court, where Kim gives a speech defending Jimmy's actions as nothing more than a mistake driven by anger. The two celebrate their victory later that night, with Jimmy only getting a one-year suspension rather than permanent disbarment. Call the Pope, because according to your summation, I had to be a saint, me and Mother Teresa, right up there with her. Saint Jimmy, yeah, that has a nice ring to it. Boom. Okay, I've been trying to avoid this for the past couple videos, but 
The amount of scenes in this show involving bare feet as the sole focus has become too big to ignore, especially with Kim. There were maybe like two feet scenes overall in Breaking Bad, but out of the blue, that number increased into the double digits once we entered Better Call Saul. And that's just with Kim. But why? Who's responsible for putting these little piggies on display? Well, I'll have to save that question for later. I'm too busy looking at Bob Odenkirk's Instagram. Oh great, this joke again. Hey... Wait a second. Oh my... It... It, it all makes sense! Rebecca stops by the office and asks Jimmy to help her get Chuck out of the house, which Jimmy refuses. Rebecca realizes that she got bamboozled by Jimmy, and that he never wanted to help Chuck in the first place. Jimmy, he's still your brother. Not anymore, he's not. Chuck was right about you all along. Enjoy your champagne. Thank you! Mike goes to a meeting with Stacy to talk about Maddie, while Chuck mentally recovers from the ass-fucking he just took in court. Howard tries to cheer Chuck up with a 35-year-old McCallan. I'm not gonna tell you how much it cost, but don't worry, it's coming out of my end. Man, I want to be a lawyer. Howard tells Chuck that Jimmy got suspended for a year, and convinces him that this was still a win at the end of the day. As Howard leaves, Chuck pulls the batteries out of the tape recorder, and begins his journey to overcome his sensitivity to electricity. We get a really funny montage of Jimmy telling all of his old-ass clients that he won't be able to be their lawyer for the year, and Jimmy makes the horrible realization that his ads are still running on TV. He manages to pull them before they air, but he's forced by the TV station to use the rest of his ad space, or else he'll have to pay a hefty fee. Kim suggests throwing in the towel and giving up the lease in the office space to save cash, but Jimmy insists on keeping it as he's come up with another way to make cash for the time being. For a reasonable price, we will shoot your commercial, and then we'll throw in the airtime for the low, low price of free. We'll shoot nine commercials for The makeup lady gives Jimmy the idea to make an ad about creating commercials for smaller businesses, but before they start filming, Jimmy remembers that he can't use his name in the ad, so he re-strategizes. While he does that, we're given a sequel to one of the best cold opens in the entire Breaking Bad universe, the one from Kafka-esque, as we're shown a Los Pollos Hermanos truck sneaking in several blocks of meth. They distribute the meth, and while Nacho is allowed to take five, he takes six instead, which pisses off Tyrus. Nacho says that Hector is expecting six, so Tyrus tattles on Nacho to his mommy. Gus says he's chill with it though, so Nacho walks out bullet hole free. Meanwhile, Gus is exploring some new territory to build his new meth lab in, which turns out to be the laundromat from Breaking Bad, and we get a surprise cameo from a certain Stevia enthusiast. Well, it could work. Chuck continues his quest to overcome his EHS, as he walks out in public looking like an actual serial killer. He finds a telephone booth, and calls the number of his doctor. Meanwhile, Nacho talks to Hector about his encounter with Tyrus and Victor, and Hector comes up with the idea to use Nacho's dad's upholstery shop as the new mule for his meth empire. Nacho tries to convince Hector not to do it, since Nacho's dad isn't in the game, but Hector is already dead set on using him. Dumbass ponytail guy gives Hector some bad news. Leonel talked to a guy in Los Lunas. Looks like Tuco knifed the guy, but he definitely broke a guard's jaw. They got him in solitary. What? All he had to do was six months. He'd be in there forever. As Hector freaks out, he takes his heart medication to stop his body from collapsing, and he accidentally drops a pill on the ground, which gives Nacho an idea. Meanwhile, Jimmy shows Kim the new advertisement he'll be airing, which features Jimmy taking on a different persona with an all-too-familiar name. What's that I see? Albuquerque's next TV star? It's you, small business owner! Call me, Saul Goodman! The world needs to know about you and your business! Call me now! Call me now. Saul Goodman? Yeah, it's like, Saul Good, man. <laughs> that guy has a lot of energy. Yeah. It's just a name. Beats here. Season 3, Episode 7. Expenses. The episode begins with Jimmy and a bunch of other people lining up for community service. He starts collecting trash under a bridge, and he picks up a bottle of piss. A joke that's going to age very well two videos from now. After he picks up the piss bottle, he picks up a few calls from potential customers as a result of the new advertisement. 
However, after they finish for the day, Louis CK only counts 30 minutes of the four hours that Jimmy worked due to him using his phone, which frustrates Jimmy. 30 minutes, that's not, that's not right. You could do better than that. You could make it zero. Dickhead. Afterwards, he rushes to his car and cleans himself off with a bunch of wet naps before heading off to film a few commercials. He tries pressuring this one guy into filming more commercials for more money, but he says no, so Jimmy and the film crew are left with shit. However, Jimmy wants Kim to think that he's making European OnlyFans model money, so he drains his bank account and uses whatever he has left to pay off the bills for the office, as well as the Chinese food. Yeah, keep the change. A dollar. Yeah. We can make it zero. Dickhead. The gods have opened up the clouds and graciously gifted us this episode, with the return of Mr. Baseball Cards himself, Price. He walks into his house and runs into Nacho, who Price is very happy to see. Ah! Nacho assures Price that he isn't there for his baseball cards, but rather to ask him to obtain a bunch of empty capsules for a specific prescription. Mike fulfills a promise to Stacy and works on some new cement for the church playground, and he meets this new girl, Anita, who helps him out. Later that night, he spots Price watching porn in his car, who asks him to be his backup man once again, which Mike refuses. Kim shows signs of her exhaustion working at Mesa Verde, in one of the most relatable scenes ever, as she sets a timer for five minutes to take a nap, only for the show to jump cut immediately to the timer going off. Paige makes fun of Chuck for being an asshole, and Kim acts like an asshole to Paige, which she apologizes for. Kim makes a sudden comment about Chuck, claiming that all she and Jimmy did was tear down a sick man, before returning back to her work. Jimmy rushes around for another day of filming commercials, and he ends up flooding the battery to his car, drawing a lot of parallels to Jesse and Walt in the RV, so he and the film crew end up taking the bus. Holy shit, for a moment there, I completely forgot Jesse and Walt even existed. Is Better Call Saul a good show? The owners of the shop are starting to have second thoughts shooting the ad, and Jimmy gets desperate, and offers to shoot the spot for free as long as they use his services in the future. They shoot the ad, and Jimmy pays the film crew for their work out of his own pocket. He sits on the curb, realizing how much he fucked up, and the nice makeup lady offers to give her share back to Jimmy, which Jimmy rejects. Mike goes to group therapy once again with Stacy, and talks to Anita, who tells him a story about her now-deceased husband. Later, Mike goes outside and calls Price, and accepts his offer for bodyguard work. Jimmy takes Kim out on a trip to do some more conning work, and they spot a guy acting like a huge douchebag, and Jimmy's anger starts to manifest as he comes up with a really intense scheme to take the guy down. Kim says, all right, dude, you gotta calm down, this is just rhetoric. And she talks to Jimmy about Chuck, asking him if there could have been another way to take him down. Jimmy justifies his actions, saying that everything that happened to Chuck was his own fault. Meanwhile, Nacho meets with Price, who's surprised that he's also brought Mike along. Mike already knows all about Nacho's plan, and he asks Nacho how he's gonna make the switch between Hector's pills and Nacho's happy pills. Nacho tells him that Hector keeps his pills in his coat pocket, and he'll make the switch then. Mike warns Nacho that the Salamancas are some spooky bitches, and if he gets caught, he'll be fucked. He checks Nacho's gas cap for any trackers, and warns him that he's also got more than the Salamancas to worry about, as well as advising him to come up with a plan to switch the pills back. Nacho makes the deal with Price and Mike, but not before Mike asks one more favor of Nacho. The next day, Jimmy meets with his insurance agent, and tries to get a refund on his malpractice insurance. However, the insurance lady tells Jimmy that they can't, and not only can they not cancel it, but his premium is gonna go through the roof once he goes back to lawyering, due to his suspension. Stunned by this news, Jimmy has a breakdown in the office, airing his grievances to the insurance lady all about all the hardships he's facing in his life, and at one point during his spiel, lets out the news about his brother's mental illness and his breakdown in court, which the insurance lady writes down on a piece of paper. What are you writing? No, don't write. I, I didn't mean to say that. I don't want him to get in trouble with you guys because of me. Sorry, I'm gonna go. Even though I hate Chuck and I really hope this news fucks with him massively, I still hate the insurance lady more for using this information to sabotage Chuck. Like, this poor guy's crying in front of you about his brother, and you can't wait to fuck with him until after he leaves? Jimmy's, and to an obvious extent, Bob Odenkirk's, acting is also great. The way that he uses his real emotions to trick and deceive people is very unique to watch. I should be mad at him for this, but that insurance lady still pisses me off even more. Oh, and Chuck too. Fuck Chuck. Overall, this one's getting an A tier. Some good scenes, along with a great ending scene. Season 3, Episode 8. Slip. We're given the glorious return of the most iconic Better Call Saul character, Marco. 
As the episode opens up with a flashback to Jimmy looking around his father's now abandoned shop, he finds an old pack of band-aids in the ceiling tile. Except whoopsie daisy, those aren't band-aids, those are coins. They use the coins in their future cons to earn some money. And Marco asks Jimmy why he kept a bunch of random coins in his father's shop. Jimmy tells him a story of the time a customer unknowingly gave Jimmy a rare quarter that his father tried to give back, so he secretly kept every other rare coin to himself. As Marco puts the coins in his pocket, Jimmy snatches the band-aid container, and we're taken back to the present, where Mike heads to the same place that he totally messed up the ice cream man's day. <laughs> Mike feels kind of bad about the truck driver getting killed, so he spends some time looking around for his body in this great shot in order to give the family of the driver closure. Meanwhile, Chuck talks to his doctor, telling her about the crazy fast progress he's making with his tolerance to electricity, but the doctor tells him to hold his horses, essentially telling him that Rome wasn't built in a day, and that this sickness could take a while to overcome. She asks Chuck why he called for her assistance, and he tells her about his experience being tonight's big loser during the court session. In a stunning moment of self-awareness, Chuck realizes that he might have actually been crazy after all, and seemingly admits that he was the one who put himself in this situation. This condition... To me, it's as real as that chair. It's as real as this house. It's as real as you. But what if it's not? What if it's all in my head? And if that's true, then what have I done? The advertisement worked wonders for the guys at the guitar shop, but since they're assholes, they take advantage of Jimmy essentially giving them a free advertisement, and completely rip him off, severing their ties with him and using their own money to air Jimmy's ad without his permission. In a desperate move, Jimmy goes back to his roots as Slippin' Jimmy and pulls an impromptu con on the asshole twins. Guys, sorry to interrupt, just want to make sure there's no wiggle room here. We are with customers right now, please, alright, just go. Best of luck in all your future endeavors. Go. Goodbye. Go. Sorry about Sorry about that. You guys have liability insurance, right? Kim has a clinky clink with Kevin and Paige. When Howard goes full goody two-shoes mode and acts like a saint towards the three, Kim pulls a fast one and leaves the table, writing a check for Howard to pay him back for taking care of her student loans. Howard sees this as some sort of way for Kim to cut ties with the firm once and for all, so he bites back at Kim for doing this, saying that Kim betrayed the firm, and that he spent the past two weeks talking with every client to try and save HHM's reputation. Kim bites back at this bite back, accusing Howard of trying to cover up Chuck's mental illness, and that she was only doing her job to save Jimmy. Your debt is forgiven, but anything else, that's on you. All Jimmy and I did was show the situation for what it is, and if you are hiding that from your clients, well, Howard, that's on you. Later that night, Nacho starts working on Hector's substitute happy pills, as well as practicing his method to sneak the pills into Hector's pocket. Meanwhile, Chuck heads into a grocery store without his space blanket, and manages to go an entire trip without having an electrical meltdown. Jimmy recovers from his slip and fall at the office, by playing the smoke on the water riff on his free sick-ass guitar, really ringing in the return of Slip and Jimmy. Jimmy gives Kim his half once again, but Kim tells Jimmy to take a chill pill for a while, and makes an offer to pay for the expenses for the time being, which Jimmy rejects. Chuck meets Howard outside his house after getting his groceries, and Howard tells him that there's an issue with his malpractice insurance. Nacho fucks with the store's AC in order to get Hector to take his coat off. He gives Hector a supposed counterfeit bill to inspect, and uses it as a distraction to take Hector's real prescription out of his coat pocket. He swaps the pills with his own happy pills, and in an extremely intense moment, walks over to sneak the bottle back into Hector's coat. Nah, I'm just kidding, he made it in. Jimmy continues his community service, and he watches as Louis C.K. denies one of his fellow workers the opportunity to visit his sick daughter. Jimmy decides to help the guy out in exchange for 700 bucks, and he starts resting on the ground to attract the attention of Louis. While he says that he won't count Jimmy's hours, Jimmy threatens a litany of lawsuits towards Louis, which he says will cost him an ungodly amount of money. Let my friend here visit his sick daughter in the hospital, and you can let me rest my back on this sacred, now litter-free New Mexico soil. Oh, and we keep our hours. Mike realizes that he can't spend any of his money from the Hector truck bust, so he meets back up with a certain chicken man to work for him. A tier. Season 3, Episode 9, 
fall. Jimmy visits Irene with some cat cookies, catching up with her life and asking her about the Sandpiper settlement. Jimmy's excited to get his fat stack of cash from the settlement, but Irene denies his money boner and tells him that she hasn't settled yet, because the annoying intern lady at Davis and Maine told her not to. God, I hate her. She's just... She's too real. Jimmy cries about Irene not settling, but Irene doesn't give a shit. She invites Jimmy to smoke crack with her friends, but he denies her offer and cries in the parking lot. Mike watches some nerd on a Segway as he waits to meet with Lydia, arranging his paycheck from Gus to be laundered through Magical. Mike says that Lydia is risking a lot for Gus, considering that he's a drug dealer and stuff, and Lydia essentially warns Mike not to fuck with Gus and undermine his operation. What do you mean? This guy? He seems so friendly. <laughs> Oh. Howard and Chuck meet their asshole malpractice insurance agents, who tell them to have someone supervising Chuck at all times, or else they'll double their premiums. Chuck, who I somehow find right in this argument, threatens a lawsuit, and the agents leave the office. Chuck talks to Howard about how sick this new lawsuit is gonna be, but Howard suggests to Chuck that it might be time to throw in the towel. Chuck thinks that this suggestion is outrageous, and tries to convince Howard that he's not crazy by acting like a crazy person. I'm better! Howard, I'm fine! This is not what fine looks like. I'm just now realizing that Chuck still has a scar left from his injury all the way back in season two. Howard tells Chuck that he can't work with him anymore, and Chuck leaves the office like a big fat baby. Kim deals with a new client, Gatwood Oil. As a way to bring in some more revenue to pay off the office, Kim has some car trouble, so she uses some nearby plywood and pushes her car out of the dirt, which doesn't go exactly as planned. <laughs> I gotta say, Kim might just be one of the best characters in the entire show. She's an incredibly hardworking and interesting character, but isn't completely stoic 24-7, and actually lets certain parts of her personality shine, especially around Jimmy. She started out as the kind of voice of reason at the beginning of the show, but as the series has progressed, it's become pretty clear that she's not an entirely moral person. What an all-around great character. Also, Rhea Seahorn is hot as fuck. I'm sorry, I can't take it anymore. She's a fucking 10. And I'm tired of pretending like she isn't. How old is she anyways? What? God damn, who did she sacrifice? Jimmy confronts Howard about settling the Sandpiper case, and Howard tells him that he's gonna have to wait to earn his paycheck, since he's planning to earn a lot more than just the projected one million. Jimmy criticizes Howard for putting his clients in jeopardy, and Howard criticizes Jimmy for being a hypocrite, considering the dicking over Jimmy incurred on Chuck like four episodes ago. Settle this and settle it now. It's in everyone's best interest. Meaning it's in your best interests. And if we don't, what are you gonna do? Peel off some members of the class? I know you're low enough to do something like that, but you're too damn greedy. You do any of that, you'll be jeopardizing your payday. You'll get your damn money. You're just gonna have to wait for it. Gus and Hector's crews meet up to discuss how their product will be delivered, and Eladio tells Hector on the phone that his product will be shipping through Gus's operation, to Hector's slight disdain. Jimmy runs into Irene in the mall with absolutely no malicious intentions, and offers her a pair of free shoes. He asks her what size she is, and grabs one of multiple pairs of shoes from his car in her size. As Irene leaves with a new pair of Jordans, Jimmy commits one of the scummiest acts in the entire show, and lies to her friends behind her back, telling them that Irene is purposefully not settling the Sandpiper case to spite them, and that she already has enough money to spend on her own, explaining the new pair of shoes that she's wearing. This causes Irene's entire friend group to turn their backs on her, as they ignore her during a mall walking session. Man, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. Chuck might have had a point. We follow up that sad scene with an even more sad scene, as Nacho tells his dad that Hector is going to be taking over the shop soon, and that he'll have to hand over the shop, or else he'll be killed. Nacho's dad doesn't say anything, only telling Nacho to get out of his house, and Nacho leaves on the brink of tears. Howard receives a letter from Chuck, which he assumes is his retirement letter. However, Howard quickly realizes that this is no retirement letter. God damn it, Chuck. You're suing Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill. Howard angrily asks Chuck why he's suing HHM, and Chuck basically says that he's going to tear down the entire firm, unless Howard lets him be his partner again. Okay, time. Wow, 39 entire seconds of me being on Chuck's side. That's a new record! Jimmy returns back to his job as the bingo host at Sandpiper, and he fills certain balls with a magnetic liquid, rigging the game to win in Irene's favor, making her seem like an even bigger prick to her friends than she does already. Give it up for the big winner, Irene Landry! Come on, let's hear it for Irene! 
Irene, we go. Hey. Irene weeps to herself as Jimmy asks her what's wrong, and Irene tells Jimmy that her entire friend group has turned on her out of nowhere. Jimmy suggests to her that they might be doing this because of the Sandpiper settlement money. What should I do? Should I settle? Irene, you listen to your heart. Jimmy walks his stupid ass into the office, and offers Kim a shot of Zaviro and Yeho, but Kim is way too stressed and busy to enjoy herself. Jimmy tells Kim that Sandpiper is settling, and tries to convince her to stay, but she leaves anyway. She practices her speech with her client in the car. <laughs> oh man, now I gotta change my pants! Kim walks out of her car, her arm broken, and we get this amazing shot of the entire wreck, closing out the episode. What a fantastic penultimate episode. This episode is extremely underrated, with some fantastic and supremely emotional scenes, along with some great acting to boot on all sides. It feels like everyone in this episode has their own moment to shine in terms of acting, with Howard's roast session of Jimmy, Nacho's conversation with his dad, and Chuck being an asshole. Rhea Seahorn also did amazing in this episode, especially with that scene nearing the end. You might be thinking that this crash happened because of Kim overworking herself to the point of exhaustion, but... Hey, wait a second. Go back. I knew it! It was the smell of Denny's shitty food that caused her to crash. Bravo, Vince. Easy S tier. Season 3, Episode 10. Lantern. The episode begins with a flashback, with a young Chuck reading a much younger Jimmy the same book that was mentioned in the season opener. The camera slowly zooms in, eventually focusing on the lantern before cutting to black. We're taken back to the present, with Kim recovering at the hospital after her wreck. Jimmy picks up her papers at the scene, and Chuck meets with HHM, promising to cancel the lawsuit, provided that Howard lets him back into the company. Howard tells Chuck how disappointed he is in him, stating that Chuck has always put his own needs and personal vendettas before the firm. Chuck tries to imply that Howard betrayed trade him, but Howard calls him out for being wrong as usual. Eventually, Howard caves in, and offers to make a settlement out of his own pocket, handing Chuck over a check for three million dollars, and sadly telling him that he won. Howard and Chuck walk out of the office, and Howard gives Chuck's retirement announcement to the entire firm. The employees clap as Chuck exits the building, but Chuck still acts like a tight ass on his way out. Jimmy takes care of Kim with some high-quality Gatorade, and Jimmy finally admits to Kim that they should give up on the office space once and for all. Kim tells Jimmy that she could have killed someone, and that she's been running on six hours of sleep for the past few weeks. Wait, you're telling me six hours of sleep isn't normal? I've been running on four hours of sleep for the past 17 years, and look at me! I'm healthy! Nacho reluctantly takes Hector to his father's shop, and Hector talks to his father, who makes an offer with him. However, Nacho's dad has balls of steel, and flat out rejects Hector's offer, and Nacho tries his best to calm the situation down. And Hector, I'll talk to him. He'll come around. I don't trust him. Francesca helps Kim out with her schedule, and Kim decides to give herself some quality free time, and she decides to go to Blockbuster. I keep forgetting that this show technically takes place in the early 2000s. Come to think of it, Better Call Saul feels like a period piece in a lot of ways, with everyone using flip phones and Blockbuster still being in business. Kim steals a bunch of DVDs from Blockbuster, while Jimmy storms into Chuck's home, where he's shocked to see that all the electrical units have been restored. With some 24-7 lo-fi jazz playing in the background, Chuck tells Jimmy that he's disproven Jimmy's claims of him never recovering, which Jimmy denies while complimenting Chuck on this huge progress in defeating his illness. Jimmy tries to apologize to Chuck Chuck for the actions he's taken against him, stating his regrets. Chuck asks why Jimmy has regrets in the first place, stating his beliefs that Jimmy can never change his ways. What's the point? You're just gonna keep hurting people. That's not true. Jimmy, this is what you do. You hurt people over and over and over, and then there's this show of remorse. I don't doubt your emotions are real, but what's the point of all the sad faces and the gnashing of teeth? Jimmy calls Chuck out, pointing out the fact that he isn't exactly a blameless victim either, and Chuck responds with one of the coldest and cruelest lines in the entire show. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the truth is, you've never mattered all that much to me. I'm not even joking with you. This is the first time I've ever been legitimately furious with a character in any medium. Like, I know I've done nothing but shit on Chuck and get angry at him for the past few videos, but there's something about this scene in particular that really resonates with me in the worst way possible. Chuck knows for a fact that Jimmy has nothing but the utmost love and dedication towards him. We know this because Kim has literally told him that to his face. He knows what he was about to say would absolutely break Jimmy, 
and yet he told him anyway. Chuck has always had this consistent viewpoint that Jimmy on a foundational level cannot and will not change, but it ironically speaks a lot to Chuck's character. Like, despite him getting over his illness, he still acts the exact same, treating Jimmy like he just burned his house down. And the worst part about it is that he isn't even technically wrong. Jimmy has shown time and time again to make the same mistakes over and over, pulling cons with Kim and concocting elaborate schemes to make absolute sure that things go his way. For God's sake, he was just doing that last episode. In a way, Chuck and Jimmy are two different sides of the same coin, but the main thing that separates the two apart is that Jimmy, despite his flaws, is a good-natured and caring person. His biggest flaw, though, is that he's an extremely short-term thinker, and he doesn't think about the long-term actions of his consequences, which could have all been prevented and treated had the person he'd idolized and respected for so long not completely discourage any change from occurring. It's pretty ironic, isn't it? Chuck thinks that Jimmy can't change, but the reason Jimmy hasn't changed for so long isn't because of his nature, but because of the way Chuck treats him, creating this endless snowball of shit. I think that's what really pisses me off about all this. Oh, it isn't my fault that Jimmy doesn't change, it's just the way that he is. What Chuck fails to realize is that change doesn't justify or absolve you of your past mistakes. It proves that you won't make them again. But nope, Jimmy's a douche, always will be. I don't care about you, bye bye. God, I hope he dies in a fire. Jimmy leaves Chuck's house, devastated, and Chuck starts to relapse back into his old ways, turning off all the electricity in his house. Jimmy heads to Irene's place, bringing over some gifts and checking in on Irene's social status. Irene reveals that her friends still hate her for not settling, and Jimmy tries his best to reconcile her friends, but to no avail. Chuck notices the power meter on his house is still turning, and he believes that more power is still being drawn around the house because of it. He looks around the house, trying to find the source of the electricity that keeps the power meter spinning, and he gets progressively more desperate. He cancels his doctor's appointment in order to free up time, and he starts to destroy his own house in an effort to find the source. Eventually, he cuts out the middleman, and completely destroys the power meter in an incredibly powerful scene. The score for this scene in particular is some of the best in the entire show. It really captures Chuck's descent into madness. He was this close to recovering, but in the end, he wasn't able to change. Later that night, Nacho attempts to kill Hector once and for all, but he's stopped by Gus Bolsa and his crew showing up to the scene. Bolsa tells Hector face to face that he must deliver his product using Gus's business, and that no disrespect was intended. You have to work together, it's what the boss wants. The boss can suck me! Hector shouts at Gus and Bolsa, telling them that the entire business was built on Salamanca blood. Hector, this isn't personal. It is! It is personal! Gus tells his crew to call 911 as he attempts to resuscitate Hector. Nacho switches out the pills before handing them over to the ambulance, which Gus is extremely suspect of. Jimmy tells Kim his frustrations of trying to get Irene and her friends back together, but as they're about to watch a movie, Jimmy figures out the perfect scheme, which he's reluctant to try out. Jimmy goes to Sandpiper to do some yoga with the old folks, when the annoying intern lady pops out of the blue and calls Jimmy outside. She criticizes Jimmy for taking advantage of Irene and her friends, which Jimmy responds with a comically evil sentiment. It's the only thing standing between me and a million bucks is some old lady's tears, then I suggest investing in Kleenex. You ruined her life because you wanted your money faster. Boo and who? Jimmy realizes that he left his mic on, and Irene gives a look to Jimmy before heading off with her now reunited friends. Jimmy heads out of the building, and tells the annoying intern lady that Irene will likely be going back on the settlement. Hey, well done in there. I meant every word I said. Afterwards, Jimmy, Kim, and Francesca move the furniture out of the office, and Kim and Jimmy give a farewell to Francesca. Jimmy throws away the Rolodex containing the numbers of his elderly clients, since he figures that those old fucks are smearing his name with his newfound discovery. Jimmy and Kim look at the wall one more time before heading off, leaving us with this beautiful and incredibly empty feeling shot, before transitioning us back to Chuck's place, who is not doing well in the slightest. He bangs on the table with his foot as we look at multiple shots of the broken down walls of his house. He kicks the table a few more times, knocking over the lantern placed on top of a few newspapers, a callback to the photo Mike took in chicanery, and he delivers one final kick. And that, my friends, is the end of Season 3. Man, this is a lot sadder than how these videos usually end. I never thought Chuck's death would have been so impactful. Wait. Oh yeah! 
Chuck's dead! Hooray! Okay, in all seriousness, this was an amazing season finale. What a beautiful and tragic send-off to one of the most intriguing and hateable characters in the entire Breaking Bad universe. Jimmy redeeming himself with Irene was great and hilarious. Hector having a stroke was also great and hilarious. Man, this episode is fire! Oh, uh, I, I mean, uh, it, it was really good! A definite S tier in my book. A lot of people say Season 3 is where the ball really gets rolling in Better Call Saul. And I would be lying out of my ass if I said that wasn't even remotely true. There are an ungodly amount of banger episodes in this season. Some of which I wasn't even remotely expecting to be as good as they were. Like, do you think going into this, I was expecting to give Sabro Sito of all episodes an S tier? And not only that, but above 5-0? This is the most blindsided I've ever been by any ranking. Maybe with how just okay Season 2 was, I had my expectations lowered significantly. But holy fuck. Fuck, some of these episodes are amazing. This might just be one of my most controversial rankings yet, but I don't care. Season 3 is chock full of amazing and grossly underrated episodes, and I'm not about to cave into the masses by not giving Sabro C to an S tier. The insane thing is, I only gave one episode in this entire list a B tier, which is why the A tier category is now completely taken up the screen. I apologize if that got kind of repetitive, but dude, with how amazing Season 3 is, I think that was kind of a given. The thing that scares me though, is that this isn't even where the show peaks. We aren't even close to that point. We have three more seasons of Better Call Saul to cover, and the episodes I'm going to cover in the coming months are some of the best television has to offer. And I am very excited to see you guys then. Take care.